To hear Justin Sobian talk about his late father, Keith Sobian, is to underscore the significance of this quotation from the pen of American screenwriter Philip Dunn in the film How Green Was My Valley. Men like my father cannot die. They are with me still, real in memory as they were in flesh, loving and beloved forever. How green was my valley then? The quotation is as applicable to Justin as it is to his siblings, Jules, the eldest, and Darian, the youngest. As Justin tells it, there's no one he looks up to like his father. I, I, I look at Dad really as my role model, to be quite honest. You know, if there's anybody in this whole world who I really look up to in this earth is really my father. That's what, that's what I really grew up in. Mean. He was a, a lawyer and I said, well, let me at least try to be one also, you know. I, I saw my brothers go in different paths in their career. And I know, even though he actually never told one of us, uh, you know, you have to be a lawyer or you have to be an attorney. Um, I just thought it was my aim or ambition to at least try to be, to follow in his footsteps. Keith Sobian's own professional career began with his graduation from the Hugh Wooding Law School after gaining a Bachelor of Laws degree, Upper Second Class Honours, from the University of the West Indies. He was called to the bar in 1975 and by 1979 became a partner at J.D. Sellier and Company, one of the largest and most prestigious law firms in Port of Spain. But as to how he started his political life, Keith Sobian is on record as having discredited reports that he was inducted by one or more of his well-known political relatives, men like Francis Privat and Selwyn Richardson, all laid stalwarts of the People's National Movement, and, like Sobian, all sons of the Mayaro soil. Rather, he is on record as having stated that his interest in politics was ignited for the first time as a student at St. Mary's College. It was then that the social upheaval of the 1970s and the Black Power movement became the catalyst that eventually led him into a period of intense discussion about his interest in politics and his love for his country. In 1976, he became involved with the Tapia House movement, led by the late university lecturer and noted political commentator and activist Lloyd Best. But Sobian did not join a political party until 1988, when he became a member of the PNM. In 1991, he contested that year's general elections, won the Ottawa Mayaro seat for the PNM, and was appointed Attorney General and Minister of Legal Affairs in the cabinet of Prime Minister Patrick Manning. Sobian's easygoing, down-to-earth demeanor and his ability to mix easily with the common folk would have contributed significantly to his election victory in Ottawa Mayaro. He definitely didn't live on a high horse. You know, he's a very simple fellow. I mean, he always used to tell us, well, I need to live. I just need my jeans and television. I know he, you know, he came from Miaro and you know, he said he want, when he retired, he wanted to go back and live in Miaro and fish and so on. And as to the effect politics may have had on his father's legal career, Justin feels it complemented that career. Definitely, uh, it made him more acute and sharp in his legal mind and his thinking. I mean, when I was, when he was Attorney General, I was, that was 91, I was probably 11, 12. And it's only now I'm able to appreciate and understand the role that he played, especially being an attorney now, in terms of the passage of laws and the passage of bills. And even afterwards, you know, I realized he was involved, like, in the implementation of the, for instance, the family court. I know he piloted a lot of bills in that aspect. So it's only now when you sit down and you really check it out, you're like, boy, you know, I really understood, I fully grasped what it is that he was trying to do. I mean, those days, we, I wasn't even a teenager yet, so I really didn't understand. But I think it made him a better person, you know, a marketable person, 
you know, he made him a people's person, I think, because I, I believe he served his constituency very well, and, you know, Otto Mearo. And I just think it made him a better person overall. Yeah. Sobian served as Attorney General and Minister of Legal Affairs up to 1995, when he decided to leave the world of politics and focus on another aspect of his legal career. In 1996, he took up the position of principal of the Norman Manley Law School in Mona, Jamaica, becoming the first West Indian trained lawyer to assume that office. Previous to that appointment, he served as an associate tutor and course director at his alma mater, the Hugh Wooding Law School in Trinidad. In October 2000, Sobian was appointed an adjunct professor of law at the Florida Coastal School of Law in Jacksonville, Florida, an appointment that marked the furtherance of the objectives of the Caribbean Law Initiative, which provided an opportunity for students to engage in real-life policy advice on various legal issues. But despite the positions of influence he occupied, Keith Sobian remained essentially a people person. There was an instance in uh, Jamaica in, uh, we had a security guard who actually was probably our age because it was a gated community and he always used to refer as dad as pops as his father right? because he was underprivileged type of guy he lives in Tivoli Gardens this is one of I don't know if you know about that area but it's one of the um, kind of bad areas or where there's a lot of political violence etc etc and he said boy I remember your father, you know, I was going down the road and driving his BMW and I was like, Pops, they have a game in Tivoli Garden, some youth playing, you want to go and watch it? He's like, yeah, Jones, that's his name, Jones, let's go. So he said, boy, I feel so good, you know, it's me and your Pops in a BMW driving in Tivoli Gardens and, you know, when I come out, all them bridges going to say, yeah, that's my father, and, you know, he, he kind of got on, you know, like that. I you know, because it was, it was a big thing for him too, especially driving in with, I guess, in this expensive, but to that it was nothing, I mean, you know, those the cars, the fancy cars, all those things, you know, money was nothing to him. Nor did Keith Sobian's career successes affect his absolute devotion to his wife, Judith, and their three sons. I think he had a special gift in terms of balancing his family life and professional life. Uh, especially in his law school days, you know, he would, um, yeah, he, he would, he would always be there. I think for his family, and I, al I always recall this instance too when I was in Barbados. I think really and truly at times he put his family first because when a, a year I was in Barbados and um, it was my second year and I was going through a lot of pressure in terms of the workload was really sort of getting to me and I remember examinations were around the corner and I was sitting down trying to study something in family law and I remember calling him because I couldn't get the point. I don't know, it, it, it was, a, well he made it simple, but I couldn't get the point, it was something with divorce and fault and so on in a family matter. And I don't know if it was the pressure around me and I called him and I was like, Dad, you know, I'm feeling down, you know, I have this exam coming up and I can't get it. He was in Jamaica at the time. And that was in the evening. He's like, Justin, don't, don't worry. I come up to, Bar I come down to Barbados tomorrow and we will sit down and discuss it. He called me back and said, I got, I got, I spoke to my travel agent. I got my ticket, so I'm coming down to Barbados. And he came down the very next day. And I mean, he was, he came down and he said, Justin, you know, yeah, so and so and so, you have to answer this question, so and so. He gave me a personal lesson. It was so personal, I had friends and then coming across to my apartment and sitting down and he had this family law lecture. I mean, it was about three of, three of us. And my roommate was there and he sat down and was explaining it to me. And you know, in those times, you know, something that you take for granted. I mean, I was just like, okay, well, thanks. For, I, I can't remember if I told him thanks for coming. <laughs> Apart from being his dad, Justin says his father was also his legal advisor. But as a case with his brothers, Jules and Darian, he was allowed to make his own career choices. His father was therefore quite supportive when Justin decided to pursue law at the University of Cape Town. He kind of left it up to me. Yeah, and I just choose South Africa because I always wanted to go to the African continent. 
and it was the first school that accepted me to the University of Cape Town and yeah so I ran at it I mean I did all the applications by myself you know obviously under his guidance got rooted got an international well international student scholarship and dad was excited about it he actually went down to South Africa with me he settled me down, you know, he said you want to make sure I have pots and pans. That was his excuse, you know, I have to make sure and settle you down, your pots and pans that you need to cook and so on. So yeah, he sorted me out, came down with me. And it was very weird though, because the last uh, when he left South Africa, it was the 14th of February, 2007. And um, last time, when I came back, I came back at the end of December. And you know, we only got like about a month really to see each other, you know, when I was here. But the last, uh, yeah, I, last time when he left me, it was the 14th of February 2007. And he passed away the 14th of February 2008. So I don't know, I hold, yeah, it was Valentine's Day, I hold the 14th of February as some significant day. I don't know, I shouldn't say significant, but it's some, I don't know if it has some sort of meaning. Justin says he felt his father reached the pinnacle of his career when he was appointed principal of the Norman Manley Law School, thereby gaining acceptance as a regional statesman and helping to spread his message in support of the establishment of a Caribbean Court of Justice and Caribbean unity in general. I think going to Jamaica was one of the best things that he ever did, even though at, you know, at the end he was trying to come back to Trinidad because he spent 12 12 years Jamaica. Yeah. I think that was the best move he ever did. You know, getting away from the politics in a sense, because the political game I personally didn't really like. And uh, doing that, you know, I think he was recognized throughout the region and even he got recognized outside the region, you know, in terms of the Commonwealth. And even in the America, he was a adjunct professor. He's also the president, he was the vice president of the American Caribbean Law Initiative. Uh, so, yeah, I think, I mean, a lot of people say that he had further to go, but in this world, you know what I mean, when your number call, that's basically it. And God Almighty said, as he, this is the end of your life, this is, you know, he needs you now, you've done what he put you on this earth to do. And that's so much you could really do. You can't do more than that. Thus it was that Keith Sobian departed this earth at age 56, a relatively tender age, that belies the wide extent of his achievements in law and politics in Trinidad and Tobago and the wider Caribbean region, which he served so selflessly and well. The Hummingbird Medal Gold is today awarded to Mr. Keith Stanford Sobian, posthumously, attorney at law and principal, Norman Manley Law School, Jamaica, in the sphere of regional education. Mr. Justin Sobian, his son, will accept the award. Justin Sobian is going to step forward. Himself an attorney at law. Mm -hmm.